Hi, and welcome to Moving Forward. We're, this is the beginning of a two-part program that we're going to be doing on prisons. And we're going to address the prison culture generally, and then also talk about ways for improvement in our prisons. And with me, I'm happy to have our UCSC professor, Craig Haney. He's the nation's leading expert on inmate mental health. And he's also recently gave his expert testimony at the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on the Problems of Solitary Confinement. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Okay. Um, let's start with an overview of our correctional institutions so that people can get a, a, the bigger view and, you know, the, the idea of how we compare around the world. Yeah. Well, the United States prison system has changed dramatically in the last 40, 40 years. Um, we went from having a prison system that was um, populated with about the same ratios uh, as most other countries, or most other European countries that we usually compare ourselves with. Beginning in the early to mid-1970s, however, prison system in the United States began to expand rapidly. Um, so that by the year 2000, we um, far outdistanced other nations in terms of the rate at which we imprison our citizens. We're somewhere between seven and ten times more likely to incarcerate citizens than other European nations, Germany, France, England, the countries with which we usually compare ourselves. Um, and this rapid expansion of the prison system uh, has, has produced in many states, California certainly among them, um, enormous overcrowding problems so that prisons became, over this 40-year period of time, very overcrowded. Um, and this occurred at about the same time that there was a de-emphasis on providing rehabilitation for prisoners. So not only did we pack more and more prisoners inside the prison system, but we, there was less of an am, uh, a mandate to do anything for them while they were there. So there were enormous problems with inmate idleness, with inmate violence, and with the deterioration of inmate mental health over this period of time. So uh, can you also give us a kind of an idea, the a demographic of the race, class, gender of who's in prison? Sure. Um, the majority of people who are in prison in the United States are people of color. Um, African Americans, particularly African American men, are grossly um, overrepresented in the prison system. Um, the government statistics tell us that uh, African American man in the United States has a one in three chance in his lifetime of being imprisoned. Um, so there is, a, there is an, an overpopulation or overrepresentation of African Americans and increasingly of Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, if you add the, the Latino and African American population together in most prison systems throughout the United States, again, certainly California, uh, a majority of them are of color. Um, they are virtually all poor. I mean, I mean the, the, um, the prison population in the United States is made up, perhaps not surprisingly, of people who are impoverished, um, most of them living be below the poverty line before they were incarcerated. Overwhelming majority are men. So and the overall prison system in the United States is composed primarily, uh, primarily 90 percent men, uh, about 10 percent women. Um, among the women's population of prisoners, again, women of color are much more over, much more likely to be incarcerated mm -hmm. or overrepresented in the system. So, you did some research on overcrowding. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that and what you found and what what's being done? Because they, you did inform a. The Supreme Court about a decision that was made. Yes, we, we had a. I've been working on a, a, a case with a, with a group of lawyers and some other experts for about 20 years. A case that was started in the early 1990s, um, looking at the treatment of mentally ill prisoners in California. Now, the California prison system, even in 1990, was already overcrowded. It was already significantly overcrowded, but um, it continued to get more and more overcrowded over time. So at the same time that we were trying to to improve the treatment of uh, services provided for mentally ill prisoners, of whom there were large, large numbers. About 20 to 25 percent of the people who are in prison are mentally ill. Um, they were not getting good services in California. Um, we took the prison system to court. A federal court ordered the, the, the prison system to improve the mental health treatment of the prisoners in the mid-1990s. The prison system, I think, made a good faith effort to attempt to do this, but they simply couldn't because at the same time they were trying to improve mental health care, 
the system was getting increasingly overcrowded, overrun with prisoners. So finally we went back to court and said, look, the, the system can't provide constitutionally adequate mental health care or medical care for that mm -hmm. matter because it's so overcrowded. And the only way we can fix the mental health care and the medical care is to reduce the overall population to give the prison system a chance to actually manage the prisoner population and provide them with the services they need. And in 2011, the Supreme Court agreed and ordered the state of California to reduce the population of prisoners um, by a number of 40,000. So it was a very significant court order mm -hmm. yeah. um, forcing the system to actually change in, in, in very dramatic ways. And the, uh, we've got the crime rate going down, but incarceration going up. And how does this play into really important propositions that we're, we've got coming up in November, yeah. uh, Proposition 36? Uh, how does this amend the three strikes? Well, what the, 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 it's interesting that what's happened over this 40-year period of time that I'm talking about is that the crime rate, which for a period of time was increasing, actually in the 1990s began to go down. Prison incarceration rates continued to go up. Go up. Mm -hmm. So we decoupled the crime rate from the rate of, of incarceration. And prison, in a sense, became its own, it's sort of its own entity, just kind of expanding and operating independent of the crime rate. Um, and during that period of time, one of the things that many states did, and California was among them, was to pass much harsher sentencing laws, including what three you heard mm -hmm. alluded to, something called three strikes. Now, California's three strikes law was the, most hard, was the harshest, most draconian in the country because it allowed for a, a lifetime or life sentence on the third strike, which is what most of the third strike laws did. Um, but California's allowed that third strike to be a nonviolent uh, crime. So there were, there were and are people being sent to prison for life in California on a third strike, which are nonviolent, petty, relatively trivial kinds of crimes. Yeah. I mean, you may have read the stories of people stealing socks or pizzas or a videotape. Right. So the, the proposition really is designed to remedy what I think most experts believe uh, is a misapplication of this concept. The concept being that States have a right to incarcerate people for life if they're repeated felons, if that's what they choose to do. Mm -hmm. But that last strike, the, the, the crime for which they are being sent to prison for life, ought to at least be a serious crime. And, and that's what Proposition, Proposition 36 is designed to do. And how would you vote? I mean, you, uh, in your expert opinion, you can give your opinion. Well, I think, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that the, 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 the three strikes law was really intended to protect the public from serious violent crime. Yeah. And I think this proposition actually brings it closer to the actual spirit of the law. So I, you know, I think there is, there's, there's good reason to support it. Yeah. It also would save California taxpayers a great deal of money at a time when the prison system is still very overcrowded. Um, it really doesn't make sense, not only from a public safety perspective, but also from an economics perspective, to have people incarcerated for the rest of their life on the basis of having committed a trivial crime. And, and this proposition is designed to address that and I think address it in an effective way. Well, good. Um, that's, uh, it seems like something that we, we certainly need to change that, given that it is so discriminatory too. I mean, it seems like it was the discretion of the DAs and so forth, but um, we have to keep moving along. So we're gonna, um, let's focus on the solitary confinement because this is a very big issue for you and work that you've done for a good deal of your life to work with individuals in solitary and to, to do investigation. And it's, it's a very troubling issue and it's one that uh, when you look at the history of it, we, we had an understanding here in the United States that we should end solitary confinement in the 1890s and it's yeah. just as extraordinary that we're here uh, in this you know we're c just creating more of these prisons that cr that are super maxes that's right. the the term for for prisons that are predominantly or all solitary yes. confinement yes. yeah um, what uh, you know do anything more you'd like to say about the history of it or well yes I mean I you know the it, there was a time in the United States in the distant history of the nation when all prisons were solitary confinement prisons yeah and we realized um, fairly quickly that they were doing a tremendous amount of damage to the people who were being kept under these conditions and so as you say we did away with them in the 19th century prisons since then have always had uh, places for short-term isolation you know, the, the expression is the hole. So if some, you see yeah. from prison movies, somebody acts up or they're going to be put in the hole. 
What's changed in the last 40 years is the use of long-term solitary confinement. So we've expanded the number of people that we put in solitary confinement over the same 40-year period of time I was talking about earlier, when the prison system got more and more overcrowded. We've expanded the number of people who end up in solitary confinement. And then the real change is we put them there for very long periods of time, sometimes for life. Yeah. Um, so supermax prisons are prisons that are designed to hold people, only people in solitary confinement for very long periods of time. And then the other thing, which is a little bit different from the 19th century, um, is that we've, we've, we've introduced um, modern technology into, uh, into the concept of isolation. So we can now much more effectively, much more completely isolate people mm -hmm. than we used to be able to do by controlling them technologically. So at Pelican Bay Prison, for example, Calif one of California's supermaxes, a lot of the, the very limited movement that prisoners are allowed to have out of their cells is controlled um, with automatic it's locking remote, mechanisms. Yeah, remote remote. Control. There's not even mm -hmm. any direct interaction between two human beings when a prisoner is being let out of his cell to go out to the so-called yard outside the unit. So. Yeah, and you were involved with the um, American, I mean, uh, what is it, A&E, uh, investigative reports. Yes. Um, and clearly the United States has more people in solitary confinement than anywhere else on Earth. And so let's take a uh, look at that uh, okay. clip. Good. Total isolation means total control. Lock prisoners up for 23 hours a day, seven days a week, in a concrete box. Keep them there continuously, so they can't attack other inmates or staff. Across the United States, this is the regime in more and more maximum security prisons. For prisoners in these facilities, this is as close as they will get to the outside world. Isolation has always been used as punishment. But high-tech supermax prisons are dedicated to isolating hundreds of inmates. The National Institute of Corrections estimates that there are up to 100,000 inmates held in similar conditions across the country. Being confined to a little pod, we're only eight, eight different cells, eight other inmates and a small activity yard to where you don't see nobody, you don't, it's like an isolation. Being in the cell, it is stressful. When you only can communicate through letters or when you only can communicate for, say, like an hour or an hour and a half through glass, uh, human beings, they not, they, human beings need physical contact. We treat it no different than the dogs. In 1995, a group of prisoners claimed these conditions combined with the lack of contact with other inmates and the almost 23 hours spent isolated in a cell amounted to cruel and unusual punishment. The prisoner's main complaint had to do with the conditions of confinement. In particular, they alleged brutality of the guards, inadequate medical care, inadequate psychiatric care, and oppressive conditions within the security housing unit, the SHU unit. Craig Haney, a psychologist with extensive experience in prisons, was sent to interview 100 randomly chosen inmates. I was struck when I went to Pelican Bay by what appeared to be a very high number of mentally ill prisoners who were housed in the security housing unit. And he immediately recommended that an expert in psychiatry, Dr. Stuart Gracian, be called in. Altogether, uh, at Pelican Bay, I, I think it was 50 inmates. And I documented uh, 17 cases of an acute reactive psychosis caused by the conditions of solitary confinement. In a landmark decision, federal court judge Felton Henderson stated that conditions at Pelican Bay, SHU, pushed the boundaries of what the human mind could psychologically tolerate. Supermax prisons aren't solving the problem of disruptive inmates. According to penal expert Jerome Miller, they're making them worse. There are currently 57 of them across the United States, and their high cost isn't proving a deterrent. The average cost per inmate per cell is $50,000, almost double the cost of keeping an inmate in a regular prison. If I had to go back, I would prefer a southern sheriff who locks people in a hot box in the hot sun in a tin shack for a week or whatever and brings them out half dead 
I would prefer that because that is seen as pure punishment and very evil uh, to the uh, credentialed, degreed uh, correctional administrator of a supermax uh, designed by proper architects who actually sit down and design how we can make a place more dehumanizing, how we can cut out sensory deprivation. It has about it a very ominous and evil feel because it's so thought through. Can you talk about the Senate uh, hearings that you just testified at? Yes, it was, a, it was a, actually a historic event in the, in the sense that the Senate, um, for the first time, really looked at this issue, uh, an issue which, uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier, has grown in significance over the last couple of decades. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin uh, called several witnesses to testify. Um, some of them were corrections officials. Um, one correction official from Mississippi testified about how the system in Mississippi actually improved after they began to uh, reduce the size of their solitary confinement mm -hmm. unit. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, it, I, I thought it brought a lot of uh, a light to a, a very widespread practice that not too many people know about. And even the legislators, uh, the senators, seemed shocked to hear uh, many of the things that were being talked about, uh, placing immigration detainees in solitary confinement, the high number of mentally ill prisoners who were in solitary confinement units. Um, there was very moving testimony from uh, a former Texas inmate, uh, a man named Anthony Graves, who actually had been wrongly convicted, um, spent time on death row in Texas, which included long stints in solitary confinement. Uh, and he gave very moving testimony about what that experience was like for him. Yes, he spent, what, 10 years uh, in solitary confinement, 18 and a half behind bars. Yes. For a crime he didn't commit. For something that he hadn't done. He's been, yeah. thankfully, exonerated, is, is now in the free world. But as he testified in the Senate hearing, was having enormous problems, as you might imagine, adjusting to uh, the world outside of prison after these truly traumatic experiences that he had while incarcerated. Right, and we're going to uh, show some of that, so I just want to warn the viewers that uh, it, there are some disturbing descriptions of what goes on in solitary. My experience was hell. I, I always liken it to something that you would uh, consider to be your worst nightmare. I, I had to go through that experience every day for 18 and a half years, and uh, it was just no way to live. But you uh, down there, and what I mean by that is that for some reason we feel that we have to punish people. Uh, the sentence is, isn't enough. So when I was down there, I mean, I, I witnessed guys just, you know, going insane. I, I witnessed officers doing things that they just felt that uh, they had to do. Otherwise, they would be uh, considered to be uh, soft with the inmates. So it's just a, it's a, it's a culture of madness. Uh, and it's desire, designed to drive those guys totally insane. I watch men literally self-mutilate themselves. They have to be put on razor restrictions because if they're given a razor, they will cut their own throat, their own neck, they, whatever they could cut at on their bodies. They just stand there in front of you and cut themselves. And this one man in particular that I watched do this, they took him over to what they call the psychiatric war. A few days later, he hung himself all because of the conditions. There's a man right there sitting on Texas death row right now who's housed in solitary confinement, pulled his eye out and swallowed it. All because of the conditions. Solitary confinement dehumanizes, dehumanizes us all. As I say, there's a culture of madness down there and officers feel that, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I spoke with one officer and I asked him, I said, man, why do you treat people the way you treat them down here? He said, man, because I feel like I'm doing society a favor, you know. So that's the kind of attitude they have toward the inmates. I mean, I mean, what has happened to our country? Well, we're treating each other like that. We have definitely crossed the line when it comes to punishment, crime and punishment. The guy gets sentenced at his, uh, uh, at his initial trial, and then he goes and gets sentenced while he's down there to punishment and torture. And, you know, and I, I, you know, we, we laugh when we was down there and we talk, we hear t people talking about other countries' human rights. And you're sitting here torturing us. Mm. I mean, we have an opportunity to educate a, a mass of people that are behind, that are incarcerated and move this thing toward positiveness so that when they come out, there's no recidivism anymore. But yet we, we are so 
ingrained in punishment because it's our it's our culture and it, it stems from our past you know this is the way we was treated before i knew that i was uh i wasn't a murderer and that i was a father i was a son i was a brother you know i was many things but i was not a murderer and uh so i said to myself you know they have taken my freedom but the things that they can't take from me i'm not going to give them and they couldn't take my dignity they couldn't take who I was as a man, and I was not going to allow them to define me by their labels. I knew I was Anthony Graves, and I was not a murderer. I was my mother's child, someone that they kidnapped and put on death row and tried to murder. So I, do, I was defiant in not giving something that they couldn't take from me, and that kept me sane. I think it's compelling what keeps people sane in these situations, and um, I, you know, it's, it's just so fascinating to me what kind of thing. I know in the testimony itself he mentioned religion was important to him, um, that his belief was important to him. And it's, it's just, you know, how the human spirit can, you know, triumph in that at all, yes. um, or maintain sanity at all. Well, Anthony is an extraordinary person. Yeah. Um, and, you know, un unfortunately there are people who don't make it through that experience with their sanity intact and, and you know, with the, f the obvious faculties intact that he, yeah. that he still that he still possesses um, you know Anthony's case is unusual in the sense that he got out because he was exonerated but it's not unusual in the sense that um, many people the majority of people who are in solitary confinement someday do get out and I think his testimony and his story underscores the importance of all of us thinking about the consequences of these things the consequences of these conditions and this kind of treatment for people once they're released um, we don't do a very good job in the society providing transitional services. So people come out of these terrible places where they have not had any real human social interaction, any meaningful contact. Yeah, you know, the guys years are, at a time. Years at a time. They, they don't they touch. They show them a video, right? They, they show them a little video to, to explain to them what the social world is like before they get out. Yeah. And then and they then take they them to them a bus out. station mm -hmm. and put them on a bus to wherever it yeah. is they're going to be, uh, they're going to be on parole. Um, and not surprisingly, a, a lot of people have a very difficult time uh, making that making transition. that transition. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's in, I mean, it's interesting. One of the things that I think came out of the Senate testimony is the sense in which we are, as a nation, beginning to rethink this yeah. practice. Um, some of it's being spurred by um, economics. Some of it's being right. spurred by the fact that solitary confinement is very expensive. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't do anything positive, and in fact, if there's evidence, and I think there is, that it does more harm than good, um, then this is one of the things, one of the correctional practices that's being rethought. Um, there are other countries that approach this issue differently. Um, we're not the only country that has people in prison and not the only country that has people in prison who sometimes misbehave when they're in prison. But other places um, ha approach this problem by giving those prisoners more services, more attention, more activity um, to try to get to the underlying cause of their, of, of their, of their whatever kinds of problems they're having in prison. Um, it's a cost-effective way to do it because if you cure the problem rather than make the problem worse, then it goes away. Rather, and, and, you, and, and it's a much less expensive way of, of keeping inmates incarcerated than the very expensive practice of putting them in solitary confinement, which oftentimes damages them. So in England, I know they, they um, have had excellent work to try to minimize the number of people in solitary. And I, uh, the article Hellhole, I thought was really an excellent article yes, from is. The New Yorker that was, um, and, and it was interesting what struck me was a line in there about how everyone's identity is socially created. It's through your relationships that you understand yourself. I just thought that was, um, it's an interesting concept of... of um, it, 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 it's, it's the most profoundly harmful aspect of solitary confinement is that we, it takes us, it takes prisoners out of uh, the, the environment in which their identity is maintained. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's the greatest threat to, to sanity for prisoners. Um, it's why the highest rate of, of, uh, of suicide is, is in, in isolation mm -hmm. units uh, in American prisons. Um, because when prisoners are denied the opportunity to have meaningful social interaction, many of them lose a sense of who they are, and they lose a sense of the purpose of their existence. 
Um, and once that happens, once that kind of depression envelops them and that sense of hopelessness because they're not connected to anybody anymore and they have sort of forgotten who they are in the world, um, uh, many of them resort to the most desperate kinds of measures. And so are there any, uh, we've got the Proposition 36 that, um, coming up in the election that we can work on, but are there other ones that are working on solitary confinement in particular? Well, there aren't any propositions dealing with solitary confinement, but there are, there's a movement across the country, really. The, the Senate hearing is part of it. Um, is there a to, website or some, something that you could... The, the um, American Civil Liberties Union has a national prison project. Yeah, we have, we, will run, yeah we have that link. They, they have the an excellent, an excellent um, website. Um, there's another website called Solitary Watch, which yeah. is a, uh, a, a website where there's a lot of information about solitary confinement. There's a exchange, uh, a, a, a lot of people are writing on that website, and, and, and so there's some, there's, there's people are sharing information about what's going on in different states. A number of states are actually reducing the, the, their use or reliance on solitary confinement. Oh, I mentioned good. Mississippi. Maine is another place. Um, yeah. there are, th this is part of, I think, a, a larger movement to, to, begin, to um, uh, begin to approach these problems differently. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today on this. And stay tuned for the next portion on uh, prisons. Thanks. Thank you. Go up in prison. Searching for something as certain as the concrete against my palm, I am writing this poem to survive. Wrong place at the wrong time and got caught standing straight.